In this lesson, we're going to examine current research in normative adolescent and family development. I want to briefly acknowledge the breadth and depth of normative adolescent transitions. We tend to think primarily of the biological changes adolescents are experiencing, such as puberty, and the social changes they're going through, such as changes in peer relationships. But it's critical to understand the whole realm of change that adolescents are experiencing. These changes include, but aren't limited to, new roles in society, developing more advanced thinking abilities, the ability to see faults in parents and challenge parents, changes in sexuality, establishing educational goals, learning emotional competencies, and becoming autonomous. The development of autonomy refers to adolescents' need and desire to both separate from their parents and become independent while remaining connected. So how do we talk about pairing, parenting adolescents who are experiencing all of these changes? Ray Simpson, author of the report, Raising Teens, a Synthesis of Research and a Foundation for Action from the Harvard School of Public Health, Center for Health Communication, describes five basics of parenting adolescents. First, love and connect. Teens need their parents to develop and maintain a supportive and accepting relationship with them while encouraging the teen's growing independence. Second, Monitor and observe. Teens need their parents to be aware of their activities, including school, work, extracurricular activities, peer relationships, and recreational time. And parents need to let teens know that they're aware. This comes through less direct supervision and more communication and observation. Third, guide and limit. Teens need their parents to uphold a clear yet evolving set of boundaries maintaining important family rules and values, while encouraging independence and maturity. Fourth, model and consult. Teens need parents to provide ongoing information and support around decision-making, values, skills, goals, and interpreting and navigating the larger world, teaching by example and ongoing dialogue. And fifth, provide and advocate. Teens need parents to make available not only adequate nutrition, clothing, shelter, and health care, but also a supportive home environment and a network of caring adults. Now perhaps what you're more familiar with is the language of parenting styles, and researchers have identified four primary parenting styles. Authoritative parents are both demanding and responsive. They're assertive and set clear guidelines. They're supportive but not intrusive. Research has pretty consistently found that authoritative parenting is associated with positive outcomes in young people, including competence, low levels of participation in risk behaviors, and a variety of other things. And these findings seem to be relatively consistent across diverse families. Indulgent families are responsive, but not demanding. They're non-traditional and lenient. Authoritarian parents are demanding, but not responsive, so they provide structure and expect obedience without explanation. Uninvolved parents are low in both responsiveness and demandingness. In extreme cases, this parenting style is neglectful. Because parenting styles are a topology and not a linear combination of responsiveness and demandingness, each parenting style is more than and different from the sum of its parts. What that means is that parenting styles are complex and are undoubtedly influenced by gender, culture, ethnicity, family type. For example, there are still many issues around parenting styles that researchers have yet to fully understand. Different studies reveal different percentages of how many parents fit into each of these parenting styles, for instance. And what about parents who don't fit neatly into one of these four parenting styles? So what about the good enough parent? In 1991, Diana Baumrein suggested that many families don't fit into one of these four main categories of parenting styles and therefore have traditionally been omitted from research. She proposed that these parents are sort of middle range, middle of the road parents, and this group of parents is moderate in responsiveness and, or nurturance and moderate in demandingness and setting expectations. Others have referred to this middle of the road group as good enough. So one large study of over 4,300 youth in Scotland who were aged 13 to 16 concluded that about 6% of these young people's parents did not fit into the four parenting styles and would fit into this other category. However, 
Slicker and Thornberry, in a study of well-being, concluded that 26% of parents fell into this mid-range category. So together, what these findings suggest is that the number of good enough parents may be fairly significant. But valuable data from these parents is rarely sought. So think about the families you work with. Where do they fit in the parenting style typology? Or do they fit into this good enough category? So more practically, what do parenting styles mean for working with parents? Differentiating between parenting styles and parenting practices is one way to work towards changing parental behavior. So what's the difference between parenting styles and parenting practices? Well, parenting styles are characterized by parental attitudes toward the child and the emotional climate of the parent-child relationship. So think of the four styles we just talked about. Parenting practices, on the other hand, have a specific goal. So the focus is on affecting a particular aspect of the child. Parenting styles provide a context within which different parenting practices are more or less effective. So for example, monitoring may be less important in determining drug use by teenagers with authoritative parents because of the overarching effects of that particular parenting style on the adolescent. So a strong parent-child relationship with open communication, trust, and respect may in and of itself deter a young person from using drugs, regardless of whether or not a parent is closely monitoring the teen's behavior. On the other hand, a parent that is more um, neglectful or may be fit into one of the other categories, monitoring may be much more important in that context and may operate very differently. Consider the following questions. Think of a good enough parent that you work with. What parenting practice was, would you suggest they work on and why? Or if a parent has been neglectful, how might you work with that parent on a specific parenting practice? Now, the level of conflict in the parent-adolescent relationship is one of the most controversial issues in the literature. Historically, researchers have described adolescence as a time of storm and stress, talking about extreme parent-child conflict and adolescent rebellion as an inevitable part of the teen years. Parents were then faced with the challenge of you know, sticking it out or just surviving the teen years until their teen grew out of this rebellious stage. However, what we know is that only about 20% of families encounter real serious difficulties during the teen years, and only about 5 to 10% of families experience very high levels of parent-child conflict during adolescence. High levels of conflict are typically indicative of severe adolescent problems, so something else is going on in those families. Researchers have found that for the majority of families, while a temporary and mild period of challenge is normal, Adolescence is not inherently a time of storm and stress for all families, so conflict is not an inevitable feature of adolescence relationship, but typically occurs as a function of the characteristics of the relationships. So something else is going on in the relationship that leads to this conflict. It's not simply because the child is an adolescent and now there's this conflict emerging. Further, the challenge in conflict doesn't lead to a breakdown of the family system but typically to a healthy and often positive redefinition of the parent-child relationship. So in fact, low levels of conflict may be beneficial in supporting the redefinition of the parent-child relationship. So what does this look like in families? Well, research has suggested that adolescents and mothers in two-parent families typically agree on the issues that cause conflict between them, but they tend to interpret these conflicts in very different ways. So adolescents often rate conflicts as more serious and is occurring more frequently than their mothers. Parent-child conflict is rated as the most serious during middle adolescence, so 15, 16 years old. And this divergence in mothers' and adolescents' perception of conflict is not evidenced with early adolescence. Larson and Richards found the same divergence for parents' and adolescents' emotions, and they argued that for mothers and adolescents to maintain distinct family realities is considered normal. And in fact, these divergent realities have been considered necessary for encouraging individuality in the parent-adolescent relationship. So think about the following question. Many parents still view adolescence as a time of storm and stress. How can you help to change that image into something more positive with the parents you work with? Now, 
Now, we often talk about parent-child attachment in early childhood, but parent-child attachment is critical during adolescence and even into adulthood. And research has revealed that securely attached teens are characterized by a couple of things. First, their ability to evaluate the relationship with their mothers on their own, and their ability to discuss disagreements while staying in a relationship with mothers who are attuned and supportive. And you'll notice here that most of the research has been done with mothers and their teens. So a mother who is attuned to her teen might notice areas where her teen is vulnerable, but would be sensitive to that and would be sensitive not to exploit that or take advantage of those areas. A teen who is securely attached to one parent or to both parents is more likely to come to those parents when they have difficulty or when they need to discuss a challenging topic. They're also more likely to share their parents' values about bigger issues such as religion, substance use, and alcohol. But teens and parents are still likely to disagree about things like clothes, music, or keeping their room clean, or chores. Conversely, insecurely attached young people might engage in relatively extreme attempts to control the parent through punitive behaviors. So while an insecurely attached teen might actually become more proactive and have a strong influence on events through negative behavior, it's likely they will still have a feeling of helplessness.